conditions. Thank you. I think, Patrick, you have to uh, identify yourself for the record. Apologies. My name is Patrick Whaley. I'm Assistant Commissioner for External Affairs at Buildings. Thank you. Uh, last year, my colleague and I, we passed several pieces of legislation as, pa as part of the Stand for uh, Tenant Safety Campaign uh, to provide to improve the Department of Buildings oversight over various part of the building process. And one of my legislation is uh, Local Law 149, which require uh, DOB to audit 25% of applicants that self-certify uh, their work. So does DOB have enough staff to complete these audits in a, a timely manner? And have you, uh, what is your, your plan in terms of uh, getting that started? So to answer your question briefly, yes, we do have the staffing to perform those audits. Um, the entire package of tenant protection legislation, um, of which there are a number, um, we're in substantial compliance with all of them, including this one. So currently right now, um, if there is a landlord um, who has been found guilty of harassing tenants, um, any filings that come out of that building cannot be professionally certified. Um, so we have made substantial progress on, on this local law in addition to others as well. Okay. Uh, and my last question, Chair, is that I know that in your testimony, um, Commissioner, you talk about um, the violation that you issue and some of them are oath, um, that you have to, the, the, the violator have to go to oath. In my district, I have all these oversized retail, um, all these uh, stores that uh, have large uh, space that did not comply with the regulation in Soho. And I, I've, uh, thank you know the Department of Building for issuing violation uh, to these uh, businesses. And my question is that are we collecting uh, the fines? Uh, because I've heard from some constituents that there are times where at the hearing, they don't see uh, staff from DOB there. And then the case can get dismissed or uh, adjourned. Uh, and I really appreciate uh, Department Building, you know, making that effort because we got to kind of stop this uh, oversized retail, but we don't want the, them to get away with not paying fine and think it's, oh, just a court of doing business. I understand and I appreciate your vigilance on this issue. It's a complex issue, the one that's been around for a long time. I'm disappointed to hear others say that we might not have been at the hearings. Um, I just first I'm hearing of it, but we'll definitely follow up on that. I would say that we track that regularly and I'll be able to find out how we're doing on that enforcement. If we're not, believe me, we will be back and we'll ask for another hearing. Um, but uh, as, as we've discussed in the past, it's a, it's a complex uh, zoning issue and we have issued violations to those that we think are egregiously violating the issue. But I think uh, in we need to partner again with our partners at city planning to, to, uh, to refine the words in the zoning resolution because it's a very difficult thing to apply uh, the limitations as they're worded now to the, the different types of uses that fall within that limitation of 10,000 square feet. And without getting too far into the weeds, it's kind of hard to go into right now, but I'm happy to discuss it further. Yes, uh, and I appreciate, yeah, your, your effort and your staff's uh, support on this. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Council Member. Um, before I go to uh, Council Member Joni, um, I know that he has follow-up questions on just a very basic question. Uh, city funds are added to fiscal 2018 and fiscal 2019 to DOB's budget to support a basement apartment pilot program in East New York, which will subsidize basement conversions to assist building owners with bringing existing underground apartment units up to code. How will the DOB support this program? Like, so some people are confused between HPD and DOB, what the roles are. What is the specific role in the basement apartment program as it's assigned uh, to DOB? Thank you for that question. Uh, like a lot of things, we do work closely with HPD and uh, we've shared with them, our, and I saw some of the questions that were asked of uh, Commissioner Tori Springer. Um, we absolutely talk about where we think our roles fit into applying this pilot program. So we've spent a lot of time talking to our partner agencies actually for months before we've gotten to this point. But what we're going to do is, as a DOB is uh, draft the, the uh, pilot legislation that establishes how we can uh, take action uh, legislatively and uh, from a regulatory perspective uh, how to get this pilot off the ground. We'll also obviously be reviewing all the applications and issuing the permits for, for that work and then also following up with construction inspections and finally issuing certificates of occupancy where needed. But we're coordinating regularly with 
HPD, fire department, health department, DEP, city planning, uh, the law department, and others, frankly. It's, uh, it's rather complex, but we are ready to move forward. So not to get too much in the weeds, though, would, would DOB re be responsible for uh, making an assessment on a property to see if it met the, cons the, the criteria for being accepted into the program? No, that, that is not a DOB role. Uh, I think HPD is going to do that. And Patrick, do you want to comment? Or? Yeah, I think it's, so again, it's very much a collaborative effort. But ultimately, once we have legislation in place, um, applications are going to be submitted to the city, and the buildings department, through its regulatory authority, is going to have the responsibility of reviewing those applica applications to ensuring compliance with the code and zoning and, and issuing permits for work to commence. Right. So, so I know that uh, uh, the commissioner, Torres Springer, stated that part of HPD's role would be to identify potential uh, individuals. And then I thought the next role would be for DOB to, to, to make the assessment, like to go in and see if it met the criteria, two means of egress, uh, those types of things. That seems like a buildings department. Yeah. Right from from a you know a novice perspective, it seems like that's what the, bu the building department would do to assess the safe site safety, um, and and those types of criteria. Sure, uh, my name is Thomas Fariolo. I'm the first deputy commissioner of the Department of Buildings, and so I think you're spot on. That's what we're going to be doing. But the owner would be hiring an architect or an engineer that would present the plans to us, that would then have to comply with all the requirements that are going to be in this legislation that's going to be put forth. So I know that my colleague and some of my other colleagues have uh, stated that while it's a program that could be beneficial, it seems as though that process may be quite onerous on a homeowner who may be not uh, accustomed to being a landlord, uh, right? Because it was a basement apartment or basement unit that now can be converted. They, they may not be in the business of that. And it seems as though it could be onerous. And obviously, we don't want to set uh, potential affordable housing uh, contributors up for failure uh, by having onerous fines, fees, and things associated, or even the, the mention of an architect, you know, shins shivers up my spine as a homeowner, because anytime I've had to deal with an architect, it's, it's been onerous from a, a fiduciary standpoint. Um, and, and I'm just going to let my colleague, who has a slew of questions in regards to that. If I can uh, take an attempt, Chair. Uh, Obviously, we'll continue to work with our colleagues about the, the best outreach, but there, there is an outreach mechanism in place. Um, we're not playing a primary role in that, but we absolutely are available to have preliminary discussions with homeowners and the outreach professionals from the city that are trying to uh, garner interest from the folks who, to participate because it's in the city's interest to get people to participate and then to make it as easy as possible. So we have mechanisms in our offices and since this is East New York, our Brooklyn office will be very much prepared to have preliminary discussions, to have preliminary work before, uh, before professionals are fully engaged. Now, that said, we, we are regulators. We're not designers. Uh, so we will provide advice up to the point where we would say, we think you can go ahead with this. Now go ahead and engage your architect or engineer, and we'll be here ready for you when you file. But what we do on a regular basis uh, through, our, through Patrick's people in the various borough offices and, our, and Tom's people, our technical folks, we meet with people on, uh, before they get involved heavily in projects to try to do just what you said, to try to address their concerns about getting too deep before they know whether they're going to be able to be successful or not. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember John. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Commissioner, thank you for that explanation. And I'll just piggyback on the issue of the legalizing of these apartments. I think we understand the importance. I think we. Uh, First, should highlight that many of these homeowners that have been renting out these basement apartments uh, unknowingly that they are illegal. Uh, I believe in the 60s and 70s, uh, all private homes were visited, and if there was a full kitchen and a half a bathroom, that property was assessed at a higher ratio. So it went from one family to a two family. So three times, four times a year when they pay their real estate taxes, they see two family home not knowing that their CLOs are one family. So for decades, the Department of Taxation and Finance has been benefiting from these properties at a higher tax rate classification, one, two. Obviously the intent is to make sure that the 
don't allow for dangerous conditions, the safety of those occupants. So if there's no second means of egress or carbon monoxide issues, things of that nature that are, I guess, the priority. And then also adding on additional units to our housing market, which would help offset some of the demand by increasing the supply. If we look at this from a practical point, zoning consideration, parking requirements, uh, bringing the properties up to code with even sprinkler requirements makes, on top of the architect engineer, the construction work that would be needed, makes this almost impossible, even if the home qualifies uh, with current zoning, parking, um, minimum requirements. It sounds like you were at some of our meetings earlier, I think, talking about some of the complexities here. Yes, uh, and that's why this is a pilot, because all of these things uh, have been addressed in some form to proceed with the pilot, and we are going to observe closely and try to learn what are the pertinent issues that needs to be o need to be overcome, and then try to set us up, set the city up to assist these owners as they move forward. But again, uh, we, I, I commend the, the mayor and the administration for moving forward with this pilot because it has uh, the potential to have a great outcome, and so we are ready to, to evaluate that pilot along with our partner agencies and see wh where, it t where it brings us. Right, but I agree, but at the cost of $18.6 million, uh, knowing the hurdles and the obstacles from the very beginning, that if this is going to be a CFO change versus a license or permit put in the onerous responsibility on the homeowner now for the conversion, if they can even possibly do it without sidestepping zone requirements and codes, uh, and the expense would make sense. Now they would be subject to a rent-stabilized tenant, which they're not prepared for, have no um, working experience in that sector. Putting this all together, this is a very difficult and challenging approach. So unless we're going to waive some of these requirements from the onset, and we know what they are, um, to legalize these apartments, why begin something that will yield in a net zero gain? So, council member, all the concerns you're raising are very valid concerns, and as the commissioner mentioned, these are the very types of things that we've been discussing. Just bear in mind that we're going through a pilot program right now, and we're in the process of creating that pilot through drafting legislation. Once that pilot is put in place, then we'll be doing the hard work of evalu evaluating how that pilot works out. So all your concerns are very much well-founded. We're certainly well aware of them, but we're moving forward with, with the potential of, of perhaps unleashing a large stock of new affordable housing. Certainly we all think it's something worth pursuing. We're very much aware of the concerns that you've raised, and as part of this process, again, of drafting a pilot, evaluating that pilot, these are the very kinds of things that we need to be uh, very thoughtful of. And just so I'm correct on my numbers, I believe the average architectural cost is about 15000 If they had to do a sprinkler upgrade, you're looking anywhere up to 25000 depending on the number of units. Just those two fees of 40000 to legalize a basement apartment is going to be a difficult hurdle. I think costs cost vary based on the project, mm -hmm. but there is a cost associated with doing this. And once again, we need to evaluate that work. Can you elaborate a little bit on the Build It Back program? Uh, how many more properties are out there that have not been restored and are on the waiting list, the dollar amounts, the budget for the Build It Back program? Um, and I don't mean the uh, PS, but uh, what's left in the fund to help restore these homes and where we are? Hi, good afternoon. I'm Sharon Neal. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Finance and Admin. So right now there were 5,100 uh, 5, um, jobs filed and they're pretty much in the process of um, either in process or completed and we're estimating that another 200 jobs are to be filled. The current to be filed, currently the budget is providing about 40 positions to continue that work. In terms of any additional, um, you know, um, funding to support the program outside of what's in our budget, um, HRO would probably have more information on that. You said there, f there were 5,000 applications, correct? How many have them been restored and closed out and fully funded and? Uh, I think we'd have to get you those numbers. I don't, I don't 
I mean, I have them, but I don't have them with me. This is really important. Okay. We've got so many people that are still waiting for their approvals. Of the 5,000 that were approved, how many applications were denied? So you're saying denied by DOB or denied by... Well, denied by the Build It Back program in itself. So whether it be DOB or by whatever mechanism or agency or authority, uh, applications were made uh, due to damages during Hurricane Sandy, which was more than six years ago, and they were never approved for reimbursement, for funding. Do we have those numbers? Those numbers wouldn't be provided by us. That, yeah, that's that would be HRO that would provide those numbers. We I know of the numbers of people who are in the program, who've been accepted into the program, and who have filed applications with the department. We can give you those numbers. That number is? I think it's 5,100 total that are in various stages. I could break it down. That have been filed with us. I mean, this you, the question earlier was what's our role with the, the, uh, the basement pilot. It, there's comparisons to the to the build it back in that our role is to uh, do the technical administration and regulation for the project but there's a lot bigger uh, umbrella project on ongoing so HRO is the one who processes the applications for reimbursement and then allows people to get into the program and I, there's a lot of complex uh, uh, variables in that in that activity but once it gets into the system and there are architects and engineers that file with us who have been contracted by HRO program to do it, uh, they get through our system very quickly. So uh, the moment we hear about somebody being delayed, we, we are all over it. So I don't uh, agree with the, the comments about people being held up with, with the Department of Buildings related issues on their build it back issues. Oftentimes there's other factors involved. But we stand at the ready to, to go out today or tomorrow and anytime anybody wants to talk to us. I look forward to working on that with Absolutely. the commissioner. There's Absolutely. a lot to six years later uh, where we have families that haven't been able to move back into their homes right. and are living in terrible conditions uh, is alarming and disappointing. But thank you. Let me just continue. Construction site safety. Please explain this to me. Last week I chaired the SBS uh, hearings on uh, the budget. This was already proposed in there. And it was at a $18.7 million investment <coughs> for fiscal 19 through 21 at 5 .3 and 5.3 in the year 2022. Please explain to me how is it that we are working on construction site training from two various agencies for the same purposes when we currently have much opposition from industry and in particular the uh, labor forces where they're opposing taxpayer funds to non-government entities for construction safety training when they currently offer the same training are paying for it or their members are paying for it and it looks like a bit redundancy and concerning because these are big dollar amounts and if we've been entrusted to make sure that taxpayer dollars are spent wisely your number of is it 13.2 uh, million for 42 positions Let me speak to that. There, there is a distinction between what you're seeing within SBS's budget and what you're seeing within the Buildings Department's budget. The Buildings Department budget, as it relates to construction safety, relates to performing inspections by and large, inspecting to ensure that workers on these sites have the appropriate amount of training, okay? Whereas the SBS side of the equation relates to actual training itself. The Buildings Department is not charged with training these workers. The Buildings Department is charged with enforcing the law and performing inspections to ensure that workers on these sites have the appropriate amount of training. That's the distinction between one and the other. The law also provides that the city will provide training to those individuals who have limited access to training. And I presume the money that you're seeing in SBS's budget, the total dollar amount and lines I'm not familiar with, relates to that piece of construction safety, the actual training of those workers who have limited access to training. We'll continue that as well. It just sounds like a very complicated uh, approach to something that's very simplistic in nature, um, in that there are already entities in place that have been doing this for a long, long time, and not only I'm referring to the training and the enforcement end of it, 
which I believe can be streamlined and made more efficient, but very complicated. Well, I, I agree with you, it's a very complicated issue. Uh, and it's something that uh, we're doing uh, something new that this agency hasn't done before, so uh, we will get, it, we'll get there. It's just a little bit of a learning process for us as well as everybody else. It was also brought to my attention, I think you touched on it in your uh, introduction, waterfront permitting. I believe there is a move to remove the waterfront permitting responsibilities from SPS and streamline it into DOB where it should have been from the very onset. Well, I th uh, it's, I'm not going to speak to where it should have been from the onset, but uh, that's certainly been an, a frequent question of my predecessor, to my predecessors and to me from the day that I started. And I think that the appropriate way to proceed is to um, evaluate the best way to file applications and what kind of code applies. It would be very, very simple to just transfer a couple of people and ask them to start taking applications for the waterfront. But um, we're in the process of changing our agency and we want the waterfront applications to, to mimic everything else we do, which is being the bars being set very high. So that's why we are in the process of having consultants help us create a waterfront code. And then we will incorporate it into our DOB Now platform so that everything is done online. I encourage that and Thank you. I appreciate your support. sooner than later. Um, and those are, these are softballs I threw at you so far. Uh, so let me get into some of the more difficult questions and I hope that you can help me get a better understanding. Um, there's been many complaints uh, and has been brought to my attention concerns about plan examiners. Um, with very little oversight and training and just so we have an, I have a better understanding. Architects submit plans, they go through some type of review with plan examiners, there's an approval, developer goes out, constructs, comes back to find out that the building or the construction is not in compliance, and then has to correct it, and in some cases, it's almost impossible to correct. How can it possibly be that a developer using an architect getting approved plans by a plan examiner, by the DOB, finds himself erecting a structure which is illegal and non-compliant? Well, I think uh, you heard me in my testimony that we issued nearly 166,000 permits last year after, after review. Uh, and sometimes that review is quite limited. And what we've asked to the, the architect and engineering community to do is to s professionally certify jobs that they feel confident in submitting to us uh, as long as we have a robust audit program with that. And uh, this, our uh, team here and this body here have discussed the professional certification and what we've been doing for some time. Uh, we think that our audit program is, is robust. Uh, and what happens if, if uh, an architect or engineer submits something that there's a problem with afterward, then we will raise that as an issue. We try to do it as expeditiously as possible. With that said, uh, I can't guarantee that there hasn't been a job where it's already started building where we've made an issue of it before they've gotten too far along. I, I was brought to my attention that it wasn't a self-certification. It was submitted for review and approval to find out that after approval and after construction, only when there was a, an application made for a CFO to find out that the building did not comply. So I'm happy to take that address and we'll look into it. Uh, that would certainly be a very rare occurrence if that happened. But uh, possible, but and I'm sure it's happened in your... You know why? Because we have uh, uh, human beings that are sitting looking at these plans. And so who's going to deal with human beings so that make mistakes? Where would the responsibility be? Who would be ultimately responsible? Always, always with the owner. Always. How, but the owner and their architect and engineer. Help me understand this, please. Okay. Owner, developer, yeah. ma decides to make a serious investment follows by hiring a licensed architect who I believe is entrusted to do the right thing, uh, goes to the appropriate agency for the correct approval, gets approval, and if it's human error, after the approvals have been done and the construction has been complete, only at the time of C of O application, and he's responsible after following every step of the way? Uh, Absolutely, and a perfect example is uh, your council, uh, your colleague, Council Member Chin, who uh, we would say that um, the, built the business owners for in uh, Soho 
they would argue very vehemently that they are in full compliance whether we have come to them and issued these violations. So one perfect example would be the violations that we spoke to Councilmember Chin moments ago because those folks that we issued violations to are going to argue that we're wrong in, in saying that uh, they're in violation. So th it's, not, uh, it's not uncommon for owners to believe that uh, when we're enforcing something after the fact that we're wrong, there's, there's arguments on both sides whether we're wrong or not. And if we've found that we've, wrong, we've, we've made a mistake in our plan review, then we'll absolutely be vigorous about trying to make the least impactful correction with that. And if, I, and if I could just add, architects and engineers are licensed by the state of New York. They're submitting applications to the buildings department with a sign and seal attesting that what they've submitted to this department complies with code and zoning. So they certainly bear responsibility if there are any errors. Furthermore, you know, we'd be curious to, to hear the example it sounds like you're citing so we can look at, look at it and get back to you. But to the extent there is an issue like you're explaining, it is the absolute exception. Again, the commissioner mentioned, you know, 160,000 permits that were issued, probably well over 100,000 plans submitted. The scale of work that this, res this department is responsible for is enormous. I and we're human beings, and there might be instances very, very rare where, an, where, where um, something slips. But, you know, we should all be sure that ultimately architects and engineers who are licensed by the state have an obligation to file uh, documents with the department that comply with code and zoning. First of all, the amount of work and the undertaking is tremendous for the department buildings. It's undeniable. Um, and I agree with you that a licensed architect or engineer has a responsibility here. But the process and the checks and balances to make sure that they're doing their work properly is this agency which approves their work. So there should be a responsibility on the approving agency <laughs> for human error. Otherwise, we wouldn't need permits. We'd allow it. We'd give it to the architect, the engineer, to draw up, classify, and say you can build as a right without having the approval process from building department. But there is a need for checks and balance. And there should be a responsibility on plan examiners, I would imagine, uh, and not place it just on the architects and engineers. Understood, and I, I would say that, that those checks and balances are in fact in place given the overwhelming majority of applications that we approve, permits that are issued for work that is absolutely in compliance with code and zoning. Mm -hmm. ADA compliance, thank you for that. Wait a minute, uh, Council Member, just give one more question. I'd really like to be able to today hear from the public. Mm -hmm. Sometimes we don't get to do that because the day gets too long. So if you if you would. Then what I'll do is I'll just mention some points uh, on the record and maybe if you can answer them quickly, um, considering the time constraint that we're under. I understand there's an issue with adult senior daycares in commercial zones versus residential zones um, where children's daycare do not have the same interpretation. Um, Secondly, ADA compliance in landmark areas where landmarks does not approve permanent ADA ramps subject in the properties to violation for not having permanent but offering temporary ramp service. And thirdly, and I hope you can explain a little bit on this one, uh, for actually there's a follow-up to this, there's a determination request that's made of building codes and zoning for any building other than one, two, and three family homes, there's a fee of $1,000 for the first request. If there's a, den if it's denied, then they must uh, go to Manhattan, I believe, at an additional cost of $2,500 for a determination classification. This seems like a tremendous amount of money that has to be paid for something that I would imagine our um, department buildings would be easy to respond to, to make sure that we don't have human error on architects or engineers where the developer is ultimately held responsible to hold the bag of correction if there needs be. And the last part of this, and the citywide savings, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong, I believe store signage the codes, the laws were implemented back in 1961 without any further updating. Since then, there was a moratorium because very few of our signage is complying, and I believe the law 
says no more than 12 square feet of signage, printable signage is permitted. One of the issues that you bring up is that you're looking to increase on citywide saving program will be the dollar amount of revenue will be an increased collection of revenue from fees related to illuminated signs, which I understand are a problem to begin with and illegal. So explain this to me. We issue permits for a sign that's illegal, that doesn't comply with the laws to find out that later on there'll be a penalty that starts at $5,000. Sorry, that's a, and it's a very loaded hot potato. So there's a, there's a lot there, obviously. Mm. What I'd like to do, in the interest of time, I can touch on a couple of those things, but we haven't had the opportunity to actually sit down with you, and we can do that in real short order and get into the meat and potatoes of all these questions that you're raising. You know, in terms of going backwards, in terms of the signage issue, we're issuing permits for the sign structure, not for the actual sign, and that's an important distinction. They get a permit to put a sign structure up. Subsequent to that, they get a permit to put a sign up, and that's where there might be a problem. So yeah, I that, would say so. That's, that's the <laughs> distinction, and it's an important distinction. You can put a sign structure up in a certain area, but then putting, depending on the size of the sign on the structure, that's where there might be issues with code and zoning. And the last source of revenue is going to be um, develop a request to reinspect hazardous areas. So I would imagine we want to make this as painless as possible where there's very little hurdles to overcome to have hazardous, to have to reinspect hazardous conditions. By placing additional fees on this would allow or deter reinspection of hazardous areas and conditions. I'm just trying to clarify that we should be looking in the best interest of the people, citizens, developers, uh, and all the stakeholders, of course, that the more hurdles that we place and requirements that we place that we don't even hold ourselves accountable to creates a challenging environment to build and develop, um, and I'm just concerned. But I'm mm. looking forward to Understood, to Council Member. We hear your concerns loud and clear, and we look forward to sitting down with you in short order to go through all these issues and more. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, just because we're moving along and in the, in the interest of time, I do agree with my colleague about uh, a lot of the onerous uh, situations that homeowners find themselves in. So certainly we will circle back and over the course of this next four years, hopefully begin to reduce or even look at it in a, in a good common sense way, uh, how we can be more supportive. So thank you, Council Member. Thank you for your patience. Mm -hmm. Council Member Rosenthal. Thanks so much. Uh, and com uh, Chair Carnegie and Commissioner, it's great to see you. Thanks you for coming over. You know, I'm going to ask you, as you know, about the Office of the Tenant Advocate. And uh, you're shocked. I know. Shocker. Um, but I want you to know that I, I was thinking about the question I would ask sitting here, and I realized that Patrick is the Office of the Tenant Advocate for me, and I do appreciate him. And I mean that in all sincerity. I mean, I call him. He sends out inspectors. and. Um, we get some results, so I do appreciate that. Um, currently, in the preliminary budget, are there lines for a true office of the tenant advocate? I think in the um, fiscal responsibility that was attached to the original bill, there were two lines. Is that part of the 75? So at this time, no funding's been provided for the Office of the Tenant Advocate? No, I'm asking, oh, in the preliminary budget, no. none. And do you expect it to be funded in the executive budget? It's not Are clear. you asking the mayor for funding for the Office of the Tenant Advocate? So currently, the way the functions of tenant advocacy are handled, they're typically cross-departmental. So at this time, we're dealing with the, the issues by having the contact information on our website, the Office of the Building Marshal is the primary contact that... that and so you're missing my question. I only have a second, and I'm not going to play, okay? We need an office. The bill asked for an office of the tenant advocate, and it required 
in the fiscal statement to FTEs. I'm asking you if the Department of Buildings asked for two FTEs for the executive budget, yes or no? No. Okay, thank you very much. Um, let me give you two examples of why we need an Office of the Tenant Advocate, some people who would actually be actively advocating about tenants, would be able to see patterns, would be able to do the patterns of harassment, would be able to do the work of reviewing the tenant protection plan in a meaningful way, would be able to implement all the laws that this mayor signed this past summer, right? So I'm, I've pulled up two recently. Uh, this one just yesterday. Commissioner, you might remember, I, I forget if it was in my first or second year, I spoke to you at a, about a building where, um, I'm really not going to say the name of the owner out loud, but it was somebody who you knew. And um, the way that harassment manifested itself at that building, this is a penthouse, rent-regulated building. I'm sure the developer would love nothing more than to sell it or rent it out for squillions. But no, there's a rent-regulated tenant who lives there and has rights. And um, last year, I spoke to you about the fact that the building owner repeatedly took out work permits um, to fix some facade work uh, right outside this gentleman's window. Uh, there had been several permits pulled. The jackhammering continued for a number of years. Um, now the latest complaint is that uh, literally the complaint says, um, my neighbor, this guy who's being harassed, sorry, his neighbor is saying my neighbor, um, Ha has a new illegal structure above his kitchen posing extreme fire safety concerns for the entire building. Last summer, the complaint, and I don't think I mentioned this to you, was that there was an illegal manufacturing business being operated in this apartment. This is a 15 foot by 15 foot studio apartment. So just to be clear, this unit has not changed. It was rented in 1975, and no structural work has be been done. If there was an office of the tenant advocate, somebody would be there noticing this pattern and practice of harassment, and you know, perhaps would be working with HPD or using other tools to make it clear to the owner of the building that they needed to stop doing that but we don't have that right now. The second example is of a building where um, there was a fire uh, in the building, half the units were rent regulated, half market, and the, um, the fire destroyed all the apartments, everyone was out. It's now a year and a half later. Remarkably, the market units have been brought back and are ready to rent out. But the rent regulated ones, of course, you couldn't enter. There's been no work to fix them. And previously, DOB did the right thing in issuing a vacate order. But no one is paying attention to the fact that this building owner has plenty of money to refurbish for the market rate, but not for the rent regulated. I mean, I have a story like this every week. And as excellent as your building marshals are, and Patrick, and you, and you, and Tim, everyone, the intent of the law is not being carried out by the Department of Buildings. And um, I, I just, we passed a law requiring two people and an office of the tenant advocate, and I don't understand your answer. Um, we'll revisit as to what it is that we're requesting, uh, but that doesn't change that we have been doing tenant advocacy and tenant harassment work long before the law was passed uh, successfully, in my opinion, and we are doing it now. So we can call it, uh, we can call it tenant advocate. It will be within our, our uh, 
building marshal's office and will and I recall your example of the building on the Upper West Side, I believe. And um, we'll have to you look spoke to, to him at a gala, I think, that night. The owner. Yeah. I think it, yeah, possibly. Um, and so I'm happy to follow up again because uh, it bothers me. But you see, me. it doesn't end. No, and it so doesn't. So the that's why I agree member. that you're you're doing some work, and there are some people there. The nature of this problem is overwhelming, and most of the violations issued on tenant harassment cases come from the Department of Buildings, and we're not getting a response rate for curing the problems, even if they do come out. That's what an Office of the Tenant Advocate would be following, someone who is laser focused on Department of Building code violations, but from a tenant's perspective. Again, Council Member, we've had this discussion a number of times, and I think we just disagree. The functions that are captured within the legislation, the functions that you've just described now, are functions that are currently being adequately carried out by the Department of Buildings. Tenant protection related issues, the use of construction to harass tenants is taken very seriously by this department. Those complaints are prioritized. As I explained er earlier, they're forwarded to the building marshal's office for prioritized inspections. We're doing the work now. We have staff here who is reviewing the tenant protection plans. With the council's help, we now have a new law that sort of strengthens the plan, right? Requires more means and methods to protect tenants. Requires specificity. We're now performing more audits of those plans. We're now performing proactive inspections of tenant protection properties and mo occupied multiple dwellings. With your help, with the council's help, we're doing a lot of additional work to improve our ability to address this issue. Yeah. But again, the functions outlined in the Office of the Tenant Advocate are functions that are currently being addressed by the department. So just to be clear, um, I voted for Speaker Johnson and if Speaker Johnson is going to tell me that, you know, the council is taking a certain path, I'll raise my concerns in Democratic conference, but at the end of the day, I'm following my speaker's lead. This mayor signed this bill into law, and it came with two people, and it was intended to be a separate office. Thank you. So Thank you. This, this committee obviously supports its members and supports the, the bill and the law, so we will definitely be following up on behalf of uh, Member Rosenthal and, and the city. And the tenants. Yeah. Thank you very much, Chair Carnegie. Thank you. Councilman Rivera. This is, it goes along with the Councilwoman's comments. You know, because of all the construction as, as harassment that has been happening in New York City, it took a number of, council people to come together and pass the stand for tenant safety and I know that council member Chin brought this up earlier. So this is a comprehensive package trying to tackle this problem and I wanted to follow up on my predecessor's bill which was local law 159 the construction safe construction bill of rights in lobbies and hallways and buildings under construction and I want to know how is DOV going to assure compliance. I saw you had 1200 inspections that's great. Um, but I want to know specifically how you're going to be able to post this because a lot of people don't even know what their rights are, let alone to call a council person who's going to be able to make that phone call and help them out. So I want to know what you're going to do to assure that this is up and that you're, again, complying with the law that was passed. We are complying, and we have a separate tenant protection plan for all buildings uh, that are residential in nature, and we are We've laid out guidelines for the industry to as to what they need to require in those plans. They're separate plans. They're made available for our inspectors. And when we go out there, uh, they're checking the, the tenant protection plans that they were required to be approved by the examiners. If they're not, they're getting summonses accordingly and stop work orders accordingly. Um, uh, and we are now doing the proactive inspections. So we have a methodology where we will identify buildings and visit them proactively without without responding to a complaint uh, as per the law. So we do think that we're complying. And also, as part of that, as it relates to the Safe Construction Bill of Rights from Local Law 159, so that, that law is in effect. As of the end of last year, um, the department is enforcing it. There's a requirement that in these buildings, um, multiple dwellings, the owner needs to post this uh, Safe Construction Bill of Rights. 
in the lobbies, by the elevator banks, throughout the entire building. HPD and the Department of Buildings is charged with enforcing that law, and we are enforcing that law. Are there any violation? Do you have any numbers pertaining to violations as to people I who are not I don't have that there? information available. I can, I can look into that and get back to you. I can look into see what complaints we've received, if any, and what's been our response to those complaints. So we can provide that information to the committee. Just to confirm that you're tracking it. The current Understood. Point. Okay. I look forward to those numbers. Thank you. So I guess this is the appropriate time to bring up uh, real-time enforcement. Uh, what's, what is budgeted for the creation of real-time enforcement, Local Law 188 of 2017, in the current fiscal year and in the out years? And how will this money be used to implement the creation and maintenance of an effective real-time enforcement unit? So obviously I'm referencing Local Law 188. So the real-time enforcement um, initiative is funded 19 positions um, in addition, and an additional $300,000 in this fiscal year. And the, um, the authorized positions for next fiscal year will grow to 57 with almost $4 million of PS costs associated with it. So I'm working with my colleagues on, um, on the enforcement efforts with uh, real-time enforcement. It's gonna most likely result in a second shift where inspectors will be assigned to a second shift in order to respond to the complaints in the, in the necessary time frame as well as weekend coverage. And then additional inspectors will be assigned to um, the borough enforcement efforts to make sure that we're complying with those requirements. So do we have a, a time frame on like total implementation? So we were just funding these positions, but uh, currently we're addressing the issues with existing staff now. and. We're in the process of advertising and hiring up. So um, by the time the program gets fully implemented in, in fiscal year 19, we hope to be completely 100% up and running. And so I'll also add, as it relates to specific to this local law, the funding that's in the preliminary budget to, is to address tenant protection issues broadly in the full package of legislation. But as of today, we are in compliance with Local Law 188, both the response times for complaints and also the proactive inspections that the law requires as well. And then uh, local, one, local law 149 of 2017 would prohibit professional, professionally certified filings for buildings where owners have been found guilty of tenant harassment. Does DOB have the, resource, the resources auditors necessary to effectively implement local law 149? And what if any additional resources may be required? So that's obviously a capacity question. So we were provided an additional two um, positions to help strengthen the resources that currently do this work. Um, we're gonna, as we continue to, to um, address the issues, we'll be assessing it, and if we need additional resources, we'll go back through the budget process and request them if necessary. Thank you, so my, my colleagues and I um, uh, have very few tools to help protect uh, tenants in the city and those that we do have, uh, we have a reasonable expectation that they'll be supported uh, by DOB um, in our efforts to do what's right for tenants in, a, in an increasingly changing environment uh, that's not friendly uh, for long-term existing tenants. So uh, this is not necessarily a hostile environment, but people are very passionate about serving their communities and their constituents and providing safe environments for, um, for their constituents across the city. And as you can see uh, here represented, there, there, or, or today there were several boroughs. So this is not, uh, these are not issues that are, are you know, uh, significant in only one borough. These are the 51 council members in 51 districts face varied degrees of, of these issues. And consequently this committee is committed to hopefully working uh, in conjunction, continue uh, to work in conjunction to get some of this resolved. So if there are no more questions, I thank you for your testimony. Thank you very much. We look forward to continued work. Thank you. Absolutely. So at this time, if uh, uh, those people who have signed up who were, were uh, from the public, uh, and I'm so sorry, uh, Ligia, Lahia. Yes. Yes. I'm so sorry. Uh, oh, no, it's Nikki Ledger. 
uh, Mr. Kamatsu, Ignacio, and that's it. The week is gone. So we're going to ask you all to come up to the podium. Um, there will be a portion affirming your testimony, and then we'll get right into. Um, as you as you well know that there are several hearings taking place at the same time, so I'm going to ask um, that you uh, we put we put a clock on. Sergeant at Arms, can I get some time on the clock? So if I can ask you to raise your right hand so that I can affirm your testimony. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? I do. So if, you, if you'll indulge, indulge me, I, I'm going to say ladies first. I hope no one okay. is so opposed to that. First, I'd like to say that no tenant, prote no tenant protection plan was posted in my lobby. In fact, no DOB permit for work in that particular apartment, two floors below mine, was, was, was posted. And I had to go to the assemblywoman's office with an aide, go to the fire department, talk to the fire captain, and two days later, um, a DOB permit was posted, but no tenant protection plan has since been posted. And the 311 operator knows nothing about what a tenant protection plan is. Okay. My name is Nikki Ledger. I am a New York City tenant who supported then applauded the passage of 13 STS bills into law. The recent unfortunate events of 85 Bowery and 272 Stag Street are violations of Local Law 188, Real-Time Enforcement, and Local Law 150. The latter mandates that an order to repair has to be issued with every vacate order so that tenants may return as soon as feasible. What will be the penalty for violating these laws? How will they be enforced? It is already abundantly clear that assuming voluntary compliance will suffice is seriously flawed. The blatant disregard we witnessed suggests two things to me. One, abundant funding of real-time enforcement is required. And two, landlords in violation of either local law be arrested by New York's finest. They are in violation of New York City law, these landlords. Instead, we find ourselves signing petitions to the mayor for a written promise for a date by which tenants can go home as though Local Law 150 did not exist. The elderly tenants of 85 Bowery are no longer hunger striking but housed in hotels, not knowing how long it will be until they return to their homes. This is shameful. The situation was preventable, the laws were in place, but where was the enforcement of said laws? Hearing that 20 inspectors be funded for real-time enforcement unit, I was stunned. Not 120, not 220. Our STS laws are a magnificent creation. However, generous funding combined with a fully staffed DOB is mandatory for their function as laws. To make it happen and for real-time enforcement to work as it was designed to, to keep our New Yorkers safe, we all need to keep watching how matters unfold. Uh, uh, thank you for that testimony. I, I will say on behalf of your particular instance, we have, um, <laughs> you have one of the loudest advocates as it relates to, to, to the, the, that Bowery property in, in the council member who has brought to my attention these things. You heard our, our conversation about real-time enforcement. I just did, yeah. Right, so I, I just want you to know that you have a commitment, my commitment, the commitment of your council member and the commitment of this committee to see this through and to have these laws implemented in a way that makes sense for residents. Thank so you. It, it's not where you want it to be, but I promise you that today was the beginning of us having, you know, uh, reviewing the oversight over, over this, so so I, I really apologize. And you can rely on something. people like myself to work with, with people like yourself. I'm clear on that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Uh, I'll keep my uh, spoken comments uh, abbreviated, and I'll rely on my written testimony uh, in the interest of time. Uh, my name is Ignacio Cauregui Lorda, and I'm the director of Legal Hand, a project of the Center for Court Innovation. I am here to urge the council to support the Center for Court Innovation as it seeks to strengthen and expand alternatives to incarceration and access to the justice, justice program through a million dollars in support from the city council in fiscal year 2019. This includes a $500,000 continuation of funding for ongoing operations and a $500,000 enhancement 
which will help us advance the City Council's goals of improving fairness, working toward the closure of Rikers Island, and bolstering access to justice. Included in the written testimony submission is a summary of this request, as well as a matrix that reflects the positive outcomes should the Council grant this request. Expanded support from the Council would also enable uh, the continuation of our public safety and alternative to incarceration programs throughout the five boroughs. Our programs, which include the Red Hook Community Justice Center, Crown Heights Community Mediation Center, the Midtown Community Court, Bronx Community Solutions, Queens Youth Justice Center, and Staten Island Center Justice Center have been documented by independent evaluators to improve safety, reduce uh, incarceration, and enhance public trust in government. With work, we work with tens of thousands of New Yorkers each year at these project sites, and the vast majority of the people we serve at LGBTQ are LGBTQ youth, immigrants, low income, or people of color. Uh, the City Council's support has been invaluable to the success of the Center for Court Innovation. The Center looks forward to continuing the work with the Council to reduce incarceration and to enhance access to justice. We respectfully urge you to continue uh, to support our work, and I thank you for the opportunity to speak. I would ha be happy to uh, answer any questions that you may have. Uh, thank you for your testimony. Um, I'm a supporter of the, the Crown Heights Mediation Center is in my district, and I've had the pleasure of working with them and seeing the results that they bring. So. Other than I support you and you can count on me. Uh, we appreciate all your support. Thank you. Thank you. I would just ask, there are two more people who signed up, if you could just join us at the podium, uh, both Brandon and Rolando. And I understand that you're SDS advocates and uh, have had a long relationship. Um, I just asked Mr. Komatsu. Welcome back. Hi. Um, so let's see. Um, okay. um, I was hoping to have the meeting in the main chamber where there was a TV screen where I could project the testimony on. Um, I had a conversation with Stephen Banks on December 14th of last year. I recorded him on audio. So let me use what he had to say to me during that public town hall meeting. I, I, I don't think that we. Transparency. I don't think that we have the capacity nor. This, this is not that it's not that type of hearing. You can just give me your testimony, and I'll, I'll offline I'll listen to what Mr. Banks said. Bottom line is, um, HPD's commissioner testified today. She essentially misled you. I've spoken to that staff. I live in a building that isn't registered with HPD validly. It hasn't been registered with HPD since the beginning of September. Um, I'm looking at HPD's own website right now that confirms it says this property is not currently validly registered with HPD. HRA gave that landlord, uh, let's see, um, more than $2 million to acquire that building to serve as a landlord. They're not making repairs. HPD issued a violation against that landlord in December of 2016. The building's been fixed. There's a hole in the roof in the building. It was leaking about a week to two weeks ago when it was raining pretty hard. I was assaulted in that building by my former uh, mentally unstable roommate. I got a concussion. He That was after he had tried to, to assault me. Um, I. I was diagnosed with a concussion on July 30th of uh, 2016. And uh, basically, the landlord pulled a bait and switch with everybody in the building. We signed one lease agreement, but then they gave us something entirely different. So we reported that fraud and forgery. No one took a corrective action. I talked to the Bronx DA on uh, March 17th of 2016, um, about two weeks after I moved into the building. They didn't do a darn thing. If they had, I wouldn't have been assaulted. Um, also, the landlord of the building is Urban Pathways. They're going to have a fundraiser on, I think, May 10th at the Grand Hyatt. So the question is, if the CEO of that company is making 200000 bucks a year, they're getting taxpayer money, um, they're not making repairs, what can you guys do about it? So um, you said Urban Pathways, I, I believe, is a, is a supportive housing it's uh, program, correct? Um, no, they're actually more, like, for lack of a better description, embezzling the cash. So what I'd like to do is, and I've asked you to do this before. I don't know what's happened with us offline. I reached uh, out. Um, so actually, I have my housing person here with me. Uh, I'd just like for you to talk to him offline because what your case is is an individual case, and, I, and I've always. There are more people in the building having similar issues. So I'd like for you to detail that for me, what's happening, so that we could be helpful. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Brandon. 
And and I, I, I don't mean to be as informal as to call you by your first name, but I'd rather not butcher your last name. <laughs> thank you. Uh, kielbasa is how it's pronounced, but thanks. Um, oh, literally kielbasa? Literally kielbasa. I could have gotten that. Just Sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, thanks, though. So my name is Brandon Kilbasa, and I'm the director of organizing at the Cooper Square Committee. Um, the Cooper Square Committee is a tenants' rights organization in the Lower East Side. Um, we specialize in tenant organizing. Uh, we're also a proud member of the Stanford Tenant Safety Coalition. And STS is a coalition of about 30 different housing groups from around the city that formed about three years ago to combat construction as harassment. Um, and if you don't know what that is, it's a huge um, intense problem sweeping the city. It's a form of tenant harassment that basically landlords use the guise of construction to um, force rent regulated tenants out of their buildings. Um, so I'm here today in the capacity of um, as a member of the STS coalition. We're asking for the funding that's in place uh, within the preliminary budget to stay intact um, for the new STS laws um, of uh, 13, uh, su uh, 13 suite lo of laws 13 new laws that in basically created uh, was created last year as the Stanford Tenant Safety Act. So we're ac asking for comprehensive funding of that. Uh, there are three laws in particular that we think have special considerations within the budget. Most of the laws are, are kind of budget or, or cash neutral, but um, Local Law 188, which is the real-time enforcement um, law that went into effect this month, is going to require about 30 new inspectors um, to create a new team um, to be out and doing targeted enforcement within communities facing construction as harassment. Uh, local Law 149, which is Council Member Chin's new law, which is going to require additional auditing of plans and permits. Um, and Local Law 161, which is the new law that will create an office of the tenant advocate. So we're here today to, here today to ask for you know funding for those laws. Uh, we all know that these new laws really only uh, have impact and become real when they're funded and the agencies can carry them out. So we're asking for that to happen today. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, and thank you for all your work. Thank you. Good one. Uh, hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Rolando Guzman, and I'm the uh, Deputy Director for Community Preservation at St. Nick's Alliance, a uh, local community organization in North Brooklyn. We are also a proud member of STS, and I'm going to um, uh, save a lot of time just by uh, give, uh, based on the background that uh, my colleague just gave. Um, I just want to talk briefly about, um, uh, first of all, I want to thank the city council. You know, I think uh, this process that we had that was for over two years, uh, it was a true and great partnership between community organizations, tenants, and city council members. And, uh, and we are very happy that this uh, legislation passed through and, uh, and then that the actual mayor uh, join in in this effort. So I think it's a great example of legislation that is gonna protect tenants. However, though, we need to make sure that the Department of Buildings is enforcing this legislation and they also, that they need the, um, the resources uh, to, to, f to f fulfill their mandate. Uh, some tenants uh, or some people testified before referring to a building 272 stack, and I just wanna use that building as a reference how uh, the real-time enforcement will save tenants' homes. Uh, 272 Stack is a building in the East Williamsburg section, and back in November, a new owner purchased that property and it started doing work without permits right away. Uh, it took the Department of Buildings about two months to go to <coughs> inspect that property. They were very close to be vacated because the landlord did such aggressive construction in the build demolition. Um, the funding for DOV, we want to make sure that the staff a new unit that is going to respond to that kind of emergencies within 12 hours. Uh, we really uh, look forward, you know, the creation of the real-time enforcement unit, um, that a specific unit that tenants can call and inspectors will re respond within 12 hours. I think that alone is going to prevent a lot of tenants being vacated from their buildings. And again, we want to thank the leadership uh, of you in this committee, and we look forward to working with you. So, so the reality is, none of the work we could do, we do here, could be completed if we didn't have advocates on the ground, really working directly with tenants. So, again, I appreciate uh, the work that you do, and I would be uh, surprised if the funding wasn't available to continue your work. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. 
I also wanted to really thank the advocate. It was, it was amazing that we all can come together two years and 13 legislations passed. And I was also very happy to see the mayor put in uh, money in the preliminary budget. So we have to make sure that money stays there and get actually, uh, and get DOB to utilize it and stop the implementing the laws. But thank you for all your great work. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This hearing is now adjourned.